Welcome to Down to Earth but Heavenly Minded Podcast. Hosted by Irving Rich, God our Savior. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 to 7, 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15, and 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 to 2. By James Boyd. Righteousness. For mere man there is no other place in relationship with God but innocence or glory. But innocence being now lost, glory is the only alternative to the lake of fire, though the latter place was never intended for man at all, Matthew chapter 25 verse 41. There can be no return to innocence, for man has acquired the knowledge of good and evil, and he has that knowledge in a fallen condition, having acquired it by an act of disobedience. And this knowledge he retains throughout his history of rebellion against God. God said of fallen man, he is become as one of us, to know good and evil, Genesis chapter 3 verse 22, and he was turned out of the garden with the judgment of death hanging over his guilty head. There was no getting back to his original state, and therefore he is cast out from the place where he had enjoyed the rich blessing of God. Now if he is to be with God at all in blessing, he must be with him in a new way. He must be with him in a way consistent with the knowledge gained by his wicked attempt to grasp at equality with God, and he must be with him in a way suited to him who could say that. As far as knowledge of good and evil was concerned, he had become as one of us. If he is to be in blessing with him he must not have thoughts of good and evil which differ from those of his creator, who alone is the source and supply of all blessing for the creature. He must learn to connect good with God, and he must also learn that all good for the creature comes from God, and lies in complete subjection to his holy and righteous will. And he must learn to connect all evil with the creature, and see it as giving character to those who are in revolt from his authority. He must also be brought to know that none is good but one, that is God, Luke chapter 18 verse 19, and to love the good and hate the evil, as God does. Having broken through the fence erected by his all-wise and beneficent creator, and having become acquainted with things which lay outside the sphere in which his happiness was enclosed. Man could not be in relationship and blessing with God on the old footing. Of course, if the knowledge of good and evil, which made him as one of us, had not been brought in by sin, and if his human moral perfections had not been disturbed by that knowledge. This might indeed have been, and in fact it was, what the law proposed. But in gaining this knowledge man fell away from God, became his enemy, and also became morally corrupt. He loved the evil which had ruined him, and which was now his master, and he hated the good, between which and himself his sin had fixed an impassable gulf. Upon the ground of creature responsibility, according to the place in which he was set on the day in which he was created, there was no standing for him at all. He not only had lost innocence, but he had fallen under the power of evil, and to innocence there was not only no return, but life as God's creature upon earth, according to his primal relationships and responsibilities, was as impossible as was his return to innocence. It may have taken, and it did take, four thousand years to bring this fully to light, but it was true from the outset, though known only to God. But the question of innocence being over as regards man, another question comes to light, and that is the question of righteousness. This the law raised fully with man as possessing the knowledge of good and evil, without raising the question of how he came by that knowledge. It promised life on the ground of perfect obedience. It was not life in heaven nor in the glory of God that it held forth as the reward of fulfilled obligations, but life upon earth, from which man at the beginning was debarred in consequence of the fall. By the fulfillment of his obligations he was to maintain himself in life and blessing here upon earth. This proved to be a ministration of death and condemnation, for the poor creature to whom it came was unable to fulfill its righteous demands. Neither life nor righteousness was obtainable under that covenant. Moses had said, as I have already noticed, that the man who did the things commanded would live in them, but as no one did them there was no one to claim the blessing. And therefore death went on with its work, undisturbed by the efforts of the creature to justify himself, and thus ward off his weapon. Therefore the question of gaining righteousness and life by the law, or, what is the same thing, by the fulfillment of creature responsibilities, is just as completely closed as is the question of innocence. That trial of man under law was carried out under the most favorable circumstances in which the creature could be placed. The people who were taken up to be thus tested were brought up out of Egypt, from the most bitter bondage that any people could be under. And they were brought out of that bondage by the almighty power of God, their eyes being made to witness his terrible judgment upon those who had held them captive. And who had set themselves in opposition to him when he had intervened as their deliverer. In the wilderness they were with God, living upon his bounty. To satisfy their hunger bread was given to them out of heaven, and to meet their thirst the flinty rock poured out a plentiful supply of water, cool and refreshing. By day the cloud sheltered them from the broiling sun, and by night the fire lit up their wanderings. 
but all to no purpose, as far as the gratitude of their hearts was concerned, they filled the wilderness with their wretched murmurings. In the land he fought their battles, gave them the lands, houses, and cities of their enemies. But what report does the law in which they prided themselves give concerning them? There is none righteous, no, not one, there is none that understands, there is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable, there is none that does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre, with their tongues they have used deceit, the poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known, there is no fear of God before their eyes, Romans chapter 3 verses 10 to 18. But now the scene is altogether altered. God intervenes for the deliverance of his poor sin-dominated creature. We have seen the way in which he has intervened in the person of the Mediator, who gave himself a ransom for all, in consonance with the desire of a Saviour God, who would have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. On earth, and in the place where man had dishonoured God, broken his laws, and refused him in every way in which he had sought to win his heart from paths of sin and death. His beloved Son magnified the law and made it honourable, glorified him in every one of his attributes, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross and thus opened up a way of salvation for the whole human race. But redemption having been accomplished we see man gone back to the Father in perfect righteousness, and thus a new place for man is laid open before the vision of faith. It is not now an innocent man, without the knowledge of good and evil, in an earthly paradise, enjoying the blessing of God in an earthly way, but it is a heavenly man in a heavenly paradise. Before God revealed in all the fathomless love of his heart, and this is now, as I have said, the only place of blessing for man wherever found. Therefore this fact changes the whole character of righteousness. It is now a question of fitness for the glory of God. And this helps us to understand the statement of the Apostle in Romans chapter 3, where he says, There is no difference, for all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. The Apostle does not mean to convey the impression that man was once fit, but fell away from that fitness. There are two statements made, the first, that he had sinned, the second, that he is short of the glory, and the reason this is stated is because the glory of God is now the standard of fitness for blessing. There is no getting back to what Adam was. That is all over, as I have said, and as scripture declares. On the original ground of relationship with God all are lost. God has intervened to recover man in Christ. All have sinned, and this does away with his title to life here on earth, and as he is short of the glory he cannot come in there, so that he is completely undone. But the gospel reveals to man a new kind of righteousness altogether, the righteousness of God, and entirely apart from law or the conduct of man in any shape whatever, though witnessed by the law and the prophets. These had testified that man had no righteousness of his own, that anything which he might boast himself in as righteousness was only filthy rags, but while rendering this testimony to the unrighteousness and undone condition of those under law, testified of righteousness on the part of God which was yet to be revealed. The sacrificial system under law and the prophetic word brought this righteousness before the people, who found themselves unable to obtain righteousness by their own efforts. But it was not then revealed, nor could it be revealed while the question of man's righteousness by works of law was still being considered. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3 verses 21 to 23. This is a righteousness not to be measured by man's accountability as a child of Adam, nor by the relationship in which such a man stood with God. But it is a righteousness which is measured only by the full revelation which God has been pleased to give of himself, and by the ability of man to stand in the full light of that revelation. It is righteousness on the part of God which, while it covers the whole ground of man's responsible career, so that he is justified from all things, places the believer in Christ before God revealed in all his attributes and in his nature as love. It is a righteousness which makes the vilest sinner who believes the gospel as fit for the glory of God as Christ is, for we are made the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. This is very different from that which was written upon the two tables of stone, and which was the righteous demand of God upon his creature man. There was no revelation of God, he spoke the words out of the thick darkness, and man was required to do nothing but love God with all his heart, and his neighbour as himself. And this was simply that he might on earth enjoy immunity from death and from all the consequences of sin. But the gospel unfolds an entirely new order of things, the righteousness of God, a new place for man in glory, in all the light of God fully revealed, and this is the place in which Christ is. 
in all the value of his infinite sacrifice, by which God was glorified, and according to the excellency of his blessed person. For it is on the ground of that which he has done that he has been so highly exalted, and the place of acceptance in which he is tells us of the unspeakable delight of the Father in him. He has glorified God, and on this account God has glorified him in himself, John chapter 13 verses 31 to 32. Now this blessed person is preached in the gospel as righteousness for every soul on earth. Just as the one that died for Adam and Eve in the garden became their covering under the eye of God, so is this glorious person held out as righteousness for all. He is the best robe, in which every poor returning prodigal is brought near to God, and accepted in his sight. And this is just what made the apostle not ashamed of the gospel. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith, Romans chapter 1 verses 16 to 17. And there was a necessity for this righteousness, for wrath was revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. All were sinners, and sinners against whatever light they had from God, whether that light was creation, tradition, or law, no one was consistent with the light he had. And hence in the day of judgment there would be nothing but condemnation for all, if God had no way of justification for man apart from works of law. For as many as have sinned without law shall perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 2 verses 12 to 16. The conduct of man having been proved to be inconsistent with whatever measure of light God had in wisdom and in goodness given to him, and the wrath of God having been revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. There is no hope for anyone on the ground of creature responsibility. And wrath must be the portion of all, whether he be Jew or Gentile, for though all have not had the same measure of light, all have been inconsistent with whatever light they had. And though the judgment will be in proportion to the light so graciously given, there is no one who has not rendered himself liable to it. And as it is wrath revealed from heaven, and not governmental, such as pestilences and the sword, it is in its nature eternal and does not terminate with the present life. It is wrath outside his moral government of the world. How is this state of things to be met? If none are righteous, and wrath is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness, how can any be saved? This is where the greatness and the grandeur of the gospel comes in. If man has got no righteousness for God, God has got righteousness for man, and the groundwork of it all is the ransom of the mediator, the blood of Jesus. This blood is on the mercy seat, bearing witness to accomplished redemption. It declares the righteousness of God, with respect to the passing over of past sins, such as the sins of believers in the dispensations which have run the courses. If God took sinners like Abel, Abraham, and David into his favor, and did not deal with them according to their works, it was not because he thought lightly of sin. But it was on account of the work of the cross, where sin has received its judgment, and where God has been glorified about it. This blood of Jesus was the foundation of blessing for all saints in all dispensations, but the principle upon which they were justified was always faith in the word of God. But now forgiveness of sins is declared worldwide, and the soul who believes the gospel is justified from all things, Acts chapter 13 verses 38 to 39. And the righteousness of God is just as available on the behalf of the Gentile as on the behalf of the Jew, for God is as much the God of the Gentile as he is of the Jew, and, indeed, it was when Abraham was in uncircumcision that righteousness was imputed to him, Rom. 4. The apostle tells us that he believed in him who quickens the dead, and calls those things that be not as being. In the steps of that faith the gospel calls all men to walk. But we have not, like Abraham, to believe that God shall quicken the dead, we have the witness of this power of God before our eyes in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses, and has been raised again for our justification. And thus believing on the God of resurrection, whose power we see acting on our behalf in the resurrection of our Lord from the dead, we are justified from all things. And the righteousness thus made ours is entirely of God, it is not our own righteousness. We had no hand in it. It is not by our works, one way or another. It is like the coats of skins, they were the work of God. It has often been said that God had not a stitch in man's apron of fig leaves, and that man had not a stitch in God's coat of skins. It is altogether the work of God. He has undertaken to clothe naked sinners, and he has provided the clothing at an infinite cost to himself. The clothes, to use the figure, are carried to men, to all men, in the gospel. The believer is clothed with Christ, who is made unto us righteousness, and we are made the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. 
Now being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we boast in hope of the glory of God. Rom. 5. We are no longer short of that glory, we are as fit for it as Christ is, for from God he has made unto us righteousness, and it is in his fitness we are fit. We have none of our own.